Hello everyone. On behalf of the SOE, the European Ophthalmological Society, I would like to welcome every one of you to our first SOE webinar on hot topics in neuroophthalmology. I'm more than delighted to moderate this webinar with uh, Jonathan Trobe. Um, before we begin, I want to run through some quick housekeeping items. Uh, what about audience questions? And you, you will have questions. You can ask questions via the uh, Q&A uh, um, button, and we'll be looking at them and trying to answer as many audience questions as possible. If you have a particular question after the webinar that was not answered, please email to SOE webinars uh, on sovision.org and we'll try and answer them in a separate document, which will then be accessed via the SOE website. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to you and uh, your colleagues later on in about a week via the SOE website and play on the SOE YouTube channel. I would I also like to talk to you through the running order for today. The first three talks will be presented and this will then be followed by a Q&A session. If you would like to ask a question, simply submit it via the Q&A button on the Zoom. Following this, we will then move on to three more talks, which will also be followed by a time for questions. Again, questions can be submitted via the Q&A on Zoom. The topics which were chosen today for this webinar are a combination of the classical neuroophthalmology armamentarium like the life-threatening diplopia and the swollen optic disc as well as the current hot subject of interest, the neuroophthalmological manifestations of COVID-19. To get the webinar started, I would like to ask you to participate in a short poll. The first one would be, which region do you practice in? And now for question two. Thank you everyone for participating in the poll. I can see that we have a wide range of professions and participation from around all the world. Now I would like to welcome our first speaker, Professor Andrew Lee. Uh, who will discuss life-threatening diplopia. Andy Lee is a very good friend and he's the chair of the uh, Houston Methodist uh, Eye Associations. And uh, I'm sure that you've heard him before. And uh, today you will hear him again on a very, very classic and important topic. Hello, my name is Andy Lee, and I'm going to be talking to you about five life-saving diplopia pearls. I want to thank Sumaya and the organizers for inviting me today, and I'm sorry we can't be there with you in person. I have no relevant financial interest to disclose. 
My father would say the definition of a bad lecture is if he changes the channel. A good lecture changes your mind and a great lecture changes your behavior. So hopefully I'll be changing your behavior in terms of diplopia, because what will happen if you don't make the diagnosis and the conditions I'm gonna describe, I see dead people and blind people too. And as if death weren't enough, I love this sign. It says touching wires causes instant death. But there's also a $200 fine. Well, if the $200 fine is not the motivation, well, death certainly should be. So here's the overview five dire diplopia scenarios. If it's not isolated, and by not isolated, I mean pain or other cranial nerve palsy, then you should work it up. An ophthalmologist should be able to count to eight, five, six, seven, eight. Those are the cranial nerves that are in contiguous uh, nature to each other. And so when you have a three, a four, you need to check the five. When you have a six, you have to check five and seven. And we have to at least get down to eight. If you have any other neurologic findings, weakness, numbness, headache, nystagmus, ataxia, if there's aberrancy during the regenerative phase, that's usually a compressive lesion, or if there's a history of cancer. When it's a third nerve palsy, you should be very worried about that. And if it's bilateral or progressive or acute and getting worse, then you have to worry about that. And if the pupil's involved, either a small pupil, that's the concomitant Horner syndrome, or a big pupil, that's third nerve palsy, or if there's a relative afferent pupillary defect. So here's a patient with acute diplopia and headache. Is this a dire diplopia? They're 55, they have new headache and diplopia, nausea, vomiting, the field shows a bitemporal hemianopsia, and they have a pupil involved third nerve palsy at the same time. Well, this is a dire situation because we're getting both the afferent and the efferent system, the bitemporal hemianopsia from the supracellar extension, but the lateral extension into the cavernous sinus is what is producing the third nerve palsy. And you can see here the hemorrhage uh, arounding this hypo intense core and my poor chiasm and cavernous sinus are feeling the afferent and efferent compression. This is a different patient. It's the last patient of the day. It's 4.55 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. They're 60, they have diabetes and hypertension, new onset, ptosis of the right eye, <clears throat> diplopia for two days, elevation, depression, and adduction deficit in the right eye. So what's the most important part of this exam? And what are we gonna do? Are we gonna call neurology, neurosurgery, neurology, uh, neuroradiology, all of the above? So here's the patient, they have a complete ptosis and an ophthalmoplegia. Well, this is the highest stakes encounter that an ophthalmologist will see. And we need to do a non-contrast CT first. And what we're looking for is this subarachnoid hemorrhage. And aneurysms account for about a third of the third nerve palsies. Unruptured, the rate of subarachnoid hemorrhage is one to 3%. But once you get a rupture, you have a 50% chance of dying at the scene. Half the people never make it to the hospital. And the symptomatic aneurysm rupture rate is 2.4 times higher than the asymptomatic rate. And so we'd like to treat this aneurysm before the rupture. This is the highest stakes encounter that an ophthalmologist will see. In the typical 60 year old with hypertension and diabetes, this patient could be a vasculopath, in which case it's just gonna go away by itself, live, or it's going to rupture and they're going to die. Half the people who survived the rupture and the subarachnoid hemorrhage are permanently neurologically impaired. And so treating the patient before the rupture is super important. So here's the aneurysm causing this third nerve palsy and a diagram showing a stent assisted uh, coil is gonna be placed here. And you can see here this peanut right here, that peanut is the aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery. And this is post endovascular coiling. And you can see we have a complete obliteration of that aneurysm and that's a cure, have a nice life. So there's a risk stratification for these third nerve palsies in the red zone, the highest risk subarachnoid hemorrhage and worst headache of my life. It doesn't matter what the pupil is doing in that third nerve palsy, high risk pupil involved third nerve palsy. That's the rule of the pupil. A pupil involved third nerve palsy is an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery into improvement otherwise moderate risk, is partial pupils or partial palsies. That is the pupil is still reactive, but it's slightly larger or not all the divisions of three are involved. That's a moderate risk that still needs imaging. And the low risk is the one you learned in the book, a isolated vasculopathic pupil spared third nerve palsy. You could observe that. However, you might still image that. And lowest risk, if you just have a dilated pupil, that's the lowest risk. Or if you just have a ptosis, that's also the lowest risk. So translating this into the Lee Homeland Security color codes in the red zone, subarachnoid hemorrhage, 
third nerve palsy, you need a non-contrast emergent CT, and you might need an angiogram after that, especially if it shows subarachnoid hemorrhage. And in the orange zone, pupil involved, third nerve palsy, that's gonna need an urgent angiogram of some kind in our hospital, that's non-contrast CT followed by CTA, MRI, MRA, and then angiogram. In the yellow zone is the moderate risk, partial palsy or partial pupil, CT, CTA followed by MRI, MRA, and you might still need an angiogram in that setting depending on high, how high your pretest probability of disease is. And in the blue zone, the vascular path, complete pupil spared third nerve palsy, you might observe that, but no one would fault you for doing MRI, MRA in that setting. And then the green zone, a dilated pupil alone or, di or just ptosis alone, I generally don't do imaging for third nerve palsy for those cases. Those are more likely to be adistonic pupil or pharmacologic dilation. And for the ptosis, it's much more likely to be a benign form like levator dehiscence or myasthenia. Those are the lowest risks. And so the, the key question is, when you're dealing with a third nerve palsy in a diabetic patient, such as in our case, you're asking yourself, do I need to work this up? Is this a diabetic third? And if you add in the RAPD, then that doesn't, that's not aneurysm anymore. So once you have the afferent and efferent, the RAPD, and in a diabetic, the thing we'd be worried about is a orbital apex lesion, such as mucor, but you should also be thinking about pituitary apoplexy. So when you have that afferent and efferent problem, you really should be thinking about pituitary apoplexy, orbital apex lesions, and in a diabetic, mucor. This is Lee's rule of cancer. This is a 65 year old patient with a history of lung cancer and diplopia. And the, the rule is, it is that cancer until proven otherwise. And if it comes to me from the cancer hospital in an R city, that's the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, a hospital devoted just to cancer, then it is that cancer until proven otherwise. So my behavior change ask for you is, instead of just writing lung cancer, please write the stage, and whether it's recurrent or metastatic disease. This helps us stratify how likely this is to be the cancer. So PMH stage 1A lung cancer status post gross total resection in 2000 with no recurrence or metastasis versus stage four lung carcinoma status post resection with multiple liver and brain meds status post chemo and radiation therapy. Well, obviously patient number two is a way higher risk of having the cancer be the cause. And of course, if it comes to you from oncology or from the cancer center, or the person has metastatic cancer, it is that cancer until proven otherwise. So any diplopia in a cancer patient is dangerous. So Lee's rule of cancer, if the chief complaint is any age old patient with a history of cancer, insert cancer, and any neuropthalmic complaint, it is that cancer until proven otherwise. You should know that it can always be myasthenia gravis, especially if there's no P's. So the reverse is also true. Before you make the diagnosis of myasthenia in any pattern of ophthalmoplegia, even if it looks like a standard sixth or third, you must make sure there's no P's. The P's are no pupil involvement, no proptosis, no pain, and no loss of perception or paresthesia. The reverse is also true. If you find any of these P's, pain, pupil involvement, proptosis, perception loss, that's the RAPD and the afferent side, or paresthesia, you really should think that's a dire diplopia. So Lee's P's equals A, not myasthenia, but B, it's something bad and that you should work it up. In addition, you need to have emergent imaging if it's bilateral and progressive. Bilateral and progressive is a big problem. And once you add in the Lee's P's, the pupil involved, a small pupil, that's the Horner syndrome, or a big pupil, that's the pupil involved third nerve palsy, that is also a big problem. I want to end with one example of this bilateral and progressive and how dangerous it is. The case is called, his name is Andrew. It's a 33-year-old white male with transient dizziness, blurry vision, followed by loss of consciousness after watching bungee jumping at the Iowa State Fair. So he was doing this two hours. Wow. Wow. On regaining consciousness, bilateral ptosis and exotropia, eyes turned out. Non-contrast CT and ER was normal. MRI with contrast was quote-unquote normal. He's about to be discharged. However, he developed the top of the Basler system uh, syndrome and was given intravascular TPA because he actually had a vertebral dissection. He got locked in, he recovered slowly, he walked out of the hospital and he wrote a book about his own experience called One Fine Day. It's written up in ophthalmology as a neuropthalmic emergency. Years later, I received a phone call from this patient. Hey, Dr. Lee, you don't remember me probably, but I had a stroke at age 33 and you helped me at Iowa. Sure, I remember you. 
I was just calling to let you know I went back to college. I got married, and now I have a new baby. His name is Andrew. Me. That's so great. Congratulations. No, Dr. Lee, you don't understand. His name is Andrew. So in summary, these are the five dire diplopia scenarios that I hope that will make a behavior change for you in your clinic. You need to make sure it's not isolated or that it is isolated. And by isolated, I mean you checked the other cranial nerves, you asked about pain, because severe pain and any other cranial neuropathy is badness. You need to be able to count to at least eight because the nerves are contiguous. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now you've heard about two in that list. You need to be, go, be able to go from two to eight. The two is RAPD. Make sure there's no RAPD. And then once you involve the pupil, that's Lee's P's, and that converts that diplopia to a dire diplopia. There shouldn't be any other neurologic finding, weakness, numbness, headache, nystagmus, ataxia. If they develop aberrant regeneration or they have a history of cancer, that's Lee's rule of cancer. It is that cancer until proven otherwise. Any third nerve palsy, you must do the Lee Homeland stratification for risk, the highest risk, pupil involved with worst headache of my life, but pupil involved and partial pupil are all dangerous. And I would recommend that you consider imaging all third nerve palsies, unless it's clearly just the dilated pupil, which isn't a third nerve palsy, or if it's a complete vascular path, isolated and getting better. Even that one, you might still consider imaging. Our imaging study of choice, non-contrast CT in the beginning for subarachnoid hemorrhage, followed by contrast CTA. And if it's negative, you still need an MRI, MRA after that because MRI is better for the non-aneurysmal causes of third nerve palsy. If it's acute, bilateral, or progressive, you need to worry. And in the acute setting, you must ensure that it gets better or document that it's getting worse. If it's getting worse, image it. And Lee's peas, if the pupil's involved, and if you have anascoria, small pupil, Horner syndrome, or big pupil, third nerve palsy, or you have RAPD, big pupil equals big problem. And I thank you for your time and attention. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jonathan Trobe. I'm the other moderator. Just want to remind you that if you have questions, Place them in the chat room. We will take all of your questions uh, as soon as we're done with the first three talks. But now it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is Gordon Plant. Gordon is one of the most sought after speakers uh, all over the world. I, he, I count him as a very old friend and as a great source for knowledge. And today he is going to share with us his thoughts about uh, positive visual phenomena. So we'll get started right now with Gordon Plant. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk on positive visual phenomena. I have no competing interests. Uh, these are the topics we're going to cover, uh, starting with terminology, which is a bit of a mess. Uh, so phosphenes are sensations of light generated at some point in the visual pathway, such as the retina or visual cortex. Uh, they are not photopsias. Photopsia is the disorder in which phosphenes are experienced, as with erythropsia, hemianopsia, etc. Entoptic sensations are visual sensations that, that are generated within the eye itself. You will often see the word entopic used for this in publications. This is quite wrong. Entopic is the opposite of ectopic. We don't use it very often. It refers to an organ that's in its proper position. Uh, floaters, on the other hand, are the shadows of debris or cells in the vitreous on the retina. And these can only be seen uh, when there's light entering the eye. The eigengrau or eigenlicht refers to the uh, spontaneously generated appearance of grayness that we all have in the absence of light, which is not the same as the color black. Visual snow is a description of a visual phenomenon which resembles uh, analog TV static, which those of you are my age will remember. Um, curiously, it was usually referred to as the war of the ants in Scandinavia, who seemed to see the black dots rather than the white dots. <clears throat> 
Tychopsia is a zigzag morphology of a phosphine most commonly associated with migraine. And visual hallucinations generally refers to more formed images. Technically, these are pseudo hallucinations if the patient has insight, i.e. knows that they're not real. So spontaneous visual sensations. As I say, we all see something in the dark, which is not uh, really complete absence of light. And uh, Horace Barlow was very interested in this as a, as a possible, um, possibly arising from noise in, in the visual pathway, perhaps generated in the photoreceptors. Uh, the problem with that is that we should see both light and dark. We should see positive and negative from the on and off uh, systems in, in the retina. And perhaps is this more like what we would see if there was visual, uh, no, it, visual noise, as visual noise, uh, this TV snow? Um, and this, of course, is now uh, become extremely important in terminology because of the condition which is known as visual snow. Uh, and one possibility is that this is awareness of, of, of visual noise. But patients vary as to whether they see this in the dark or only as interfering uh, with daylight vision. Uh, visual snow is at one part of a syndrome. Uh, the patients often complain of various combinations of these other symptoms, what I call persistent after images, other people call palinopsia, jumping texts when reading, starbursts around lights, tinnitus, tremor is a feature, and also seeing light through closed lids. So visual snow. Uh, was put on the map um, in 2014 when uh, we and others uh, uh, described this uh, as a uh, syn new syndrome and there's a recent review uh, showing where we are in the science. The blue field entoptic phenomenon, uh, this is something we can all see, not often here in London because we don't often get a clear blue sky, um, but I hope you can see on this GIF uh, th these are these represent uh, white blood cells, really the gaps between the columns of red blood cells going through the capillaries in, in the eye. And um, uh, anyone can see these uh, looking up as a blue sky. Uh, sometimes people notice them and think they've just appeared. Uh, so they may go see an ophthalmologist thinking there's something wrong. Uh, and uh, some time ago, they were actually used to monitor progress in the treatment of leukemia. So phosphines can also be induced. The commonest uh, are deformation phosphines. And these, of course, are much more visible in the dark because they're being generated in the retina. And they were uh, extensively studied by Professor Grusser uh, in Berlin. And uh, anyone can experience these by pressing on the uh, eyeball. And uh, of course, you see uh, the inverted image. You see it uh, in the opposite field. Um, and um, these were very important historically because they were used as evidence that the eye can, can actually emit light. And the emission theory of light, which, based on, which was based on the idea that the eye emitted light, dominated thinking in, in, uh, in, in Western uh, uh, medicine and, and philosophy for centuries. Um, uh, Newton, of course, realized that this was not right and that the, what your, your finger was doing to the retina was just uh, simulating what light did. And um, uh, this was eventually confirmed uh, by uh, Morgagni, who uh, did the first experiment of, of, of sitting in the dark with a friend, uh, pressing on his eye. And he, when he could see light, his friend couldn't. And he actually used phosphines to predict the outcome of cataract surgery. So other induced phosphines, not, not enough time to go into all of these in detail, but I will mention phosphines on eye movement. This can be a normal phenomenon. We think this may be stimulation of the retina by the eye muscles, um, but it also occurs in optic neuritis and occasionally with optic distrusion or other optic nerve uh, tumors and so on. And the patients will say that they see a flash of light when they move the eye uh, in the dark. So like retinal phosphines, these are washed out uh, by normal light. And of course, vitreous detachments will also uh, produce uh, this kind of phosphines, which are uh, evoked by eye movement, but maybe also head movements. 
Um, phosphines in retinal disorders. Well, uh, all the ophthalmologists uh, are familiar, of course, with vitreous and retinal detachments. Um, and attempts have been made to uh, differentiate dif the different types of phosphine uh, in toptic phenomena uh, uh, here in this particular study, looking at the difference between PVD and um, uh, macular degeneration. Um, but it, it should be emphasized again uh, that these are all washed out by normal light. So it's, they're sometimes confused with migraine, uh, but cortical phosphines are not. And um, here is an example of the big blind spot syndrome. On the left there, you will see the, the colors, which uh, for many, many years, we couldn't see any abnormality. Uh, but here uh, in this outer retinal disorder, you see the um, autofluorescence and looking back, well, perhaps it did look a bit abnormal, but we could never see it back then, uh, hence occult. Uh, but these are outer retinal disorders, which are usually associated with phosphines localized to a scotoma. And here you can see on the um, on the OCT of that same patient, uh, the outer retinal uh, disruption. Um, another uh, retinal cause of phosphines uh, is melanoma associated retinopathy. And this is a very interesting one because it's not due to structural damage. It's due to an antibody uh, which is um, blocking the effect of um, uh, the on uh, bipolar cells. And uh, this causes uh, nyctalopia and also uh, constant uh, phosphines, uh, which can be very uh, disruptive. Uh, last we, lastly, we come to migraine and epilepsy. Now, the major feature of migraine phosphines is their duration. This is the first question you must ask if you're trying to distinguish something that might be arising in the retina from something that might be arising as a migrainous phenomenon. The duration of migraine uh, visual aura is many minutes, maybe up to 20 minutes. And during that time, the visual experience will evolve in some way, it will change. Um, and as I said before, uh, these uh, phosphines are equally bright in the darkness or looking up at the noon, noon sky, uh, because they are generated with a, 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 a signal brightness. And uh, that doesn't change, doesn't matter what's happening uh, in terms of light falling on the eye. And that's a big distinction from things arising in the retina and the optic nerve. And of course, uh, there may be associated headache, but acophagic migraine, so migraine aura without headache, is very common, and particularly in older patients, uh, who may never have had migraine before. So you will see many patients, older patients coming with uh, visual aura, they don't know what it is, um, and um, it gets mixed up with detachments and, and all sorts of other things. Um, the other characteristic are, are the morphological features, and um, uh, tychopsia or zigzags is the most common, um, another is like looking through running water or heat haze or, or an image that's, that's fractured or broken up in some way. Um, there's many variations on this, but th these, are, these are fairly common. So you need to also inquire exactly what the patient experienced. Uh, I, I mentioned the term tychopsia, meaning zigzags. It actually means it's from the Greek uh, for wall vision, and it refers to this bastion. Um, uh, fortification, which was very common in continental Europe, as we call it here in Britain, but we didn't need these because we always relied on our navy. So we don't have examples of towns like this, uh, or at least not many. One on the border with Scotland, um, and um, uh, it turns out that the, the the term was actually coined by Hubert Airy, who had migraine and did produce many beautiful illustrations of his own migraine aura, um, which have been um uh published uh, re repeatedly and um uh, he was referring to this appearance of a bastion fortification when he can when he coined the term tychopsia wall vision and also known as fortification spectrum and this has many interesting features 
uh, the zigs and zags get larger as they move out in the visual field, and this relates to the uh, uh, representation of the visual field on striate cortex, which is part of the evidence that this where may be where the aura is arising. Um, and uh, the zigzags themselves could be generated by these cortical, uh, the cortical representation of orientation, which is within modules uh, throughout visual, uh, throughout striate cortex. And uh, some time ago, I got a patient to plot out the size of the zigs and zags of his migraine uh, across the visual field and uh, produce this um, uh, power function, which fits quite well with the uh, cortical magnification factor, as it's called. And we now know uh, from fMRI studies, it's very difficult to get patients in, in an fMRI when they're having a migraine. Um, that um, uh, we, we have evidence there that the migraine aura is arising in, in visual cortex. And uh, the, the phenomenology of it, the speed at which it progresses across the visual fields, field fits very well with it being generated by this type of um, uh, abnormal electrical disturbance in cortex, which is known as the spreading depression of Leon, who was a, a Brazilian uh, physiologist who first described this. And he was, uh, what he was describing as depression was that it was the electrical silence that follows the activity. And that uh, fits with, um, if we go back to, uh, oops, wrong way. If we go back to um, uh, uh, the drawing here, you can see here, uh, this is a blind area. This is a scotoma following on from the leading edge of the uh, zigzags and that fits very well with the spreading depression theory now what about occipital epilepsy this is of course much more serious because it may be due to an occipital tumor uh, these episodes are very brief i mean generally less than a minute in duration the the location in the visual field tends to be very consistent uh, if these are generated by a localized tumor uh, rather than um, a constitutional type of epilepsy. Um, and they're more often unformed uh, phosphenes. Quite commonly, they are colored blobs. And uh, Panatopoulos, who was an epileptologist um, working at St. Thomas's, one of my hospitals in London, um, he asked some patients to, with occipital epilepsy to make drawings. And you can see here uh, that uh, these uh, these two patients here drew these multiple multicolored blob shapes, nothing like the zigzags of migraine aura. Uh, another patient sent this in. He said, I can't draw, but this is what it looks like. This is Christmas wrapping paper. These are uh, colored baubles. And here's one uh, that was a bit different. Uh, but these colored blobs are quite common, and we can relate these to another feature of visual cortex, uh, which is where these. Um, they're actually called blobs because of their appearance on cytochrome oxidase uh, staining. But uh, within each of these hypercolumns in cortex is an area that processes color. And perhaps that's where the migraine aura is gen uh, uh, the migraine aura generates uh, zigzags, lines, and the and an epileptic aura uh, generates colors. Um, I'm often asked who with migraine aura needs um, scanning well generally uh it's not necessary you can make the diagnosis uh, from the clinical description um but uh if the aura is always starting in the same place in the visual field or if there's any field defect of course um or if there's um any uh, any evidence of um uh, more persistent uh, uh, less meagerness sounding uh, episodes like very brief flashes occurring as well. Uh, these are all hints uh, that this might be due to an occipital lesion. Um, I reported uh, really over the course of about 30 years, I only ever saw 20 odd patients who had occipital tumors uh, causing a migranous like aura. And, um, and we wrote these up in this article and uh, this was this was one of the patients this up uh, on the left here you can see uh, 
his drawing of his migraine aura. And this was caused by a localized cavernoma. So it always started in exactly the same place in the visual field. And in fact, it responded, the attacks responded very well to valproate. Um, so there's a, a very quick uh, summary of the various aspects of positive, positive visual disorders. And um, I think we're going to have some time for questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Goldman. <clears throat> Thank you, Gordon, for your fascinating uh, presentation. We will now move on to our third speaker, who is Carl Gornick from Cincinnati, who will discuss neuroophthalmic manifestations of COVID-19. Carl? Greetings, this is Dr. Carl Golnick. I am a neuro-ophthalmologist at the University of Cincinnati, and uh, thank, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk on neuro-ophthalmic presentations of COVID-19. I have no financial conflicts with any of the material in this presentation. My objective is that when we're done, you should be able to describe reported neurologic and neuro-ophthalmologic associations with COVID-19. Uh, this uh, publication from last year, Patterson et al., uh, reviewed SARS-CoV-2 and the central nervous system and basically sort of identified five major categories. Now they're cheating a little bit because number five is miscellaneous, but as you can see, uh, the categories they identified were encephalopathies, inflammatory central nervous system syndromes, ischemic strokes, and peripheral neurologic disorders, and then of course that miscellaneous. In a study also from 2020, now uh, studied patients from Wuhan, it wasn't a large number, but 214 patients and found that about a third, slightly more than that, had some form of neurologic symptoms. They found that the neurologic symptoms occurred uh, much more commonly in patients who had severe COVID infections and sort of vice versa. If you have neurologic symptoms, you were more likely to have severe COVID infection as well. Uh, impaired consciousness was the most common at more than a third, uh, and stroke uh, occurred about one in every 20 patients. There are different theories about how SARS-CoV-2 affects the central nervous system, and these include uh, viral neuroinvasion, could be transsynaptic, through the vascular endothelium, or even leukocyte migration. The most common symptoms in this uh, Zubair et al. publication were anosmia, agusia, and headache, less commonly as in the uh, Wuhan study stroke, although they found impairment of consciousness wasn't quite as common, seizures, encephalopathy, and um, venous sinus thrombosis. Helms et al. in a New England Journal article reviewed 58 consecutive patients, uh, the mean age of 68, uh, and found that encephalopathy, uh, prominent agitation and confusion in cortico corticospinal tract signs were the most common things. This is a chart from that publication uh, listing uh, at the, in the first sort of category neurologic signs and the frequency. Um, and you can see in their group of 58 patients, 49 or 84 percent had some form of symptoms that were related to the central nervous system. Uh, the brain MRIs, which is sort of the second category down, uh, looked at in the patients who had brain MRIs, um, a high rate of leptomeningeal enhancement, perfusion abnormalities in every patient, and stroke in three of the 13 patients with MRIs. And then they also looked at the patients in this series, only seven of whom had spinal taps. Um, and you can see the results. Uh, interestingly, at the very bottom of the table, uh, all seven had negative PCR tests for SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the spinal fluid. Agarwal uh, looked at cerebrovascular disease specifically and reviewed four studies that reported rates of cerebrovascular disease and found that if you have cerebrovascular disease, you're more likely to have severe COVID-19, which uh, probably makes sense. In terms of neuro-ophthalmologic problems, um, 
Certainly cranial nerve palsies have been reported. Some of the first reports, uh, this one from Greer and Associates, reported two patients with six nerve palsies. The first, a 43-year-old who had a fever for a few days, cough, and then developed double vision, a mild six nerve palsy, and actually had a normal MRI. Uh, and then a second patient, 52-year-old with a fever, and then a week later, uh, double vision. Interestingly, um, the, this was all done through telehealth, and I'm going to mention at the end of the talk a little bit about telehealth. And of course, that's really increased, at least in the US, increased in frequency since the pandemic. Um, this, these photographs are actually video photographs of a self, uh, a self exam through the, on, on the computer. Uh, and the patient actually during that video, which I don't have, did a self cross cover test showing the esotropia. And I think you can see from the photos, fairly good eye movements, except for a mild left abduction deficit uh, present um, in our screenshot or, or photograph to the immediate right. This double vision resolved over about 14 days. This, the six nerve palsy also resolved in the first patient over less than one month. There have been other reports of cranial nerve palsies. This patient from Dinkin and Associates had both a third and a six nerve palsy, very closely uh, associated with the, co the, the SARS CoV 2 infection. The red arrows, and you can see um, the mild uh, um, left abduction deficit and um, depression deficit on the left, uh, adduction deficit, and so on. Uh, it's mild. Uh, interestingly, they did see prominent enhancement, and these yellow, uh, red arrows, excuse me, are pointing out the third nerve and its course and the enhancement of the nerve. They reported a second patient who was 71 who had a six nerve palsy. And interestingly, um, this person did not have any evidence or signs of optic neuropathy. But the red arrows are pointing out, in this case, uh, some enhancement of the optic nerve sheath and of the uh, uh, posterior tenons area. Um, unknown, really, etiology, but findings nevertheless. Interestingly, no optic nerve dysfunction, as I mentioned. And there have been reports of uh, the Miller-Fisher syndrome, uh, the Miller-Fisher variant of Guillain-Barre. Um, in this page, uh, report from Gutierrez Ortiz et al., uh, the two patients, a 50-year-old who had asnosmia, agusia, a right internuclear ophthalmoplegia, or INO, but also a right fascicular th uh, ocular motor palsy, ataxia, areflexia, and was treated with intravenous immunoglobulin, had complete recovery over a couple of weeks. And then a second patient, a 39 with agusia, bilateral six nerve palsies, a reflexia and recovered over a couple of weeks, this time treated only with acetaminophen. And uh, there's been one report of a uh, opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome in a 57 year old with tremors, ataxia uh, for 10 days uh, after upper respiratory infection symptoms, had a normal MRI. I'm going to play this video. This is not a video of that patient, but a patient Here, with, my, uh, with opsoclonus. And straight. I'm going to turn that sound off. And you can see that there are full eye movements, but random uh, conjugate saccadic eye movements, so called saccadomania, in a, patient, a different patient with opsoclonus, uh, a finding that uh, most ophthalmologists probably don't get a chance to see. But you can see these random conjugate involuntary eye movements in a patient with opsoclonus. And then optic neuropathy has been reported. This is a 26-year-old uh, who had a cough a few days later, bilateral vision loss, and bilateral disc swelling. You can see the disc swelling on the photos in the bottom left. Um, the visual acuity was hand motion on the right, 2250. On the left, there was um, bilateral MRI nerve enhancement. You can see here on this axial image through the orbits of both optic nerves enhancing. Um, interestingly, the patient had a MOG positivity. This is myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, uh, as well as uh, being, of course, positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, MOG is something that we know can, MOG antibodies are associated with unilateral or bilateral optic neuropathy, um, and uh, they were present in this patient. So, of course, that leads to the question, well, did this patient just have MOG and SARS, or did the SARS cause the antibodies? We don't really know, of course, for sure. 
and field defects related to retrochiasmal uh, lesions or abnormalities in this patient from Bondira, 68 year old who complained of the inability to read and they had bilateral occipital lesions causing bilateral homonymous defects. Uh, the rest of the examination was normal. And cortical blindness. So this unfortunate gentleman, 61-year-old, bilateral, sudden, no light perception with extensive bilateral occipital strokes, uh, unfortunately passed away on day three of the hospitalization. And then a second patient uh, with uh, a younger person, by, again, bilateral, uh, light perception vision from bilateral occipital strokes. And I thought I would just mention this, that this is a uh, survey that was done and published in the Journal of Neuro-Ophthalmology by Moss and Associates, looking at um, neuro-ophthalmology and telehealth. So telehealth, at least in the U.S., has really had a big increase uh, with trying to see patients uh, via the phone or video. Uh, you know, as you can see from this, this table, uh, it's more or less effective. Uh, of course, things like migraine with aura, um, perhaps pituitary tumors and visual fields, and those are things that can be done or, or looked at remotely, I suppose. Uh, but if you look down at some of the things that it can be not very helpful in uh, optic atrophy and other things where you can't really see the fundus via tele. But certainly this, this report indicates that many, many more neuro-ophthalmologists are using telehealth than prior to the pandemic. So in summary, there have been a wide variety of neurologic conditions and neuro-ophthalmologic associated with COVID-19. Now, the question, of course, is, well, is it really due to COVID-19? Um, people who have uh, neuro-ophthalmologic, any of the things we've described, obviously, they can get these for other reasons and get them prior to the pandemic for a variety of other reasons. So is it just coincidence? I don't think we know the answer for absolute sure. I think some of the cases, it's, it's fairly obvious, a young person with occipital strokes uh, and COVID, it's related to the COVID, but and we don't know for sure that all of these things are cause and effect. These are at this point, as we're trying to sort all this data out, and I think it's going to take some years probably to sort out the data. Do we see any of these things at a higher frequency uh, in patients with COVID than what, that we were seeing before the pandemic, just in patients who don't have COVID? And the answer to that, I hope, will be forthcoming in the future. So I thank you for your attention, uh, and hopefully you are enjoying our neuro-ophthalmology webinar for the SOE meeting. Um, thank you, and uh, goodbye. So, Soma, are you going to take charge of yeah. the session. Go ahead. Uh, we have a number of questions from the audience. So uh, let's start. Um, I have a couple of questions to Carl. Um, I have to apologize because I haven't seen one um, manifestation related to the uh, COVID-19. All I've seen a lady who developed um, just the same day or the after, um, uh, after being vaccinated the second time, an optic neuritis. So it could be related or not, I don't know, but uh, it's a question. Uh, but I haven't seen one case because we were uh, isolated from those patients and we went on working regularly. So the good two questions would be how to treat optic neuritis after Pfizer vaccine. This is quite, uh, quite similar to my uh, uh, remark. And uh, does a newly Diagnosed phoria without diplopia needs to be checked for comitance, and that's for Andy. Well, I, I'll take the first question, if that's okay, about the, the COVID. So, of course, the, the, one of the questions is, well, we know that va any vaccine can rarely result in optic neuritis, or at least there's a, an association time-wise. 
I don't think there's a really great evidence base that tells us how to treat it. I, we think, of course, optic neuritis is inflammatory related to the immune system being uh, uh, cranked up. And I would, I would offer steroids in that case. I don't think there's evidence for that, um, especially with the, any of the COVID vaccines, because it's all too new. And, you know, we see optic neuritis all the time as neuro-ophthalmologists. I can't tell you I'm seeing any higher incidence or rate of optic neuritis than I've seen in years before the pandemic. So I would probably treat it as I would treat any optic neuritis, um, uh, but with the thought that it's, it's, it's probably not MS and demyelinating, probably, uh, and treat the optic neuritis in that fashion. Uh, but curious, certainly, if other, other speakers have other opinions. Andy, should I repeat your question? Sure. Uh, does a newly diagnosed phoria without diplopia needs to be checked for comitance? Is it mandatory? And we have another one for you. What is the ideal management for oculomotor cranial nerve schwannoma in a 10-year-old female patient? So a phoria is a pre-existing tendency for the eye to drift, and that can become symptomatic uh, intermittently. And so those intermittent phorias can become intermittent tropias. And then when it becomes a manifest deviation, it becomes a full-blown manifest tropia. A lot of people, including me, uh, have phorias. So phoria is kept in check by fusion. And so the competence issue really isn't that is important as making sure that it, there's no ductional deficit and that it's not tropic or intermittently tropic. So for you, probably a lot of people have that. I, I don't think that's that big a deal. The other question, how do you manage an uh, schwannoma of the third nerve? Is that right, Shloma? Correct. So schwannomas are benign, as you know, and they can present as third nerve palsies. They're often partial palsies. And they're slow growing, so the patient's third doesn't really go away, and, and usually it progresses. However, it's super slow, and if you take it out, you'll get a third nerve palsy, which is the thing they already have. So normally, we just observe those for clinically and radiographically. We have given stereotactic radiotherapy to some of those lesions to try and make them smaller. We have had some patients with big lesions with exophytic components. Those can be debulked. In a kid, probably we just follow the patient clinically and radiographically, and you might consider radiation therapy and debulking of the exophytic component if there's mass effect, but only for big lesions. Okay, Carl, another question for you. If a patient developed CNP after the first dose of vaccine, what would be your treatment strategy as well as your recommendation for the second dose? So if there's a cranial, I presume they mean an ocular motor cranial palsy, three, four, or six after a vaccine. Um, I, I think my treatment would simply be to observe. I don't think I would necessarily treat them with anything. I've seen some number of patients over years with that story. Again, depending on their age, is, is it the typical microvascular age range? Then who knows? Is it really the vaccine or not? But of course, you're not going to be able to convince the patient otherwise. Um, but I would observe them um, in that scenario, I think. Um, um, honestly, in terms of imaging, would I image them? I probably would image them just to be on the safe side, given the, 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 that scenario, make sure there's no other areas of inflammation or CNS inflammation. But I probably would observe and expect it to improve spontaneously. Well, we have another two for you. How could you differentiate between the MOG antibody mediated optic neuritis and the COVID related optic neuritis? Yeah. And um, have there been any neuroophthalmological pathologies after the COVID vaccine? Uh, so the first question, differentiating between COVID related optic neuritis and MOG, I mean, one of the questions is, why do you have the MOG antibody? So in the case I report I showed, uh, one possibility is that the COVID infection caused the MOG, the MOG antibodies themselves. So I mean, we don't really know why people have MOG antibodies to begin with, but there are reports of MOG antibodies being produced by a, an infection. COVID. And so it's sort of a chicken or the egg kind of a thing, I think. So I think the, the bottom line is, I'm not sure there is a way to differentiate. And again, remember when we talk about uh, you know, manifestations, these are really just um, 
associations as yet. They, it's not, I don't think there's really good proof um, that it's necessarily directly related to the, to the, uh, the COVID, the, the infection itself. So I'm not sure that there is a way to differentiate those two things at this point in time. Um, maybe with future patients and data, we'll know more. The other question had to do, can you repeat the other question? Any neuro-ophthalmological pathology oh. of the COVID oh. vaccine. So I'm not sure, oh, after the vaccine. So I'm assuming when you use the term pathology, you mean findings as opposed to actually like pathologic specimens. <laughs> Yeah, um, after the vaccine, there I can tell you that there there have been a number of case reports of uh, occurrences after the vaccine. I've had a number of patients. Of course, in the U.S., we have 270 million people who've been vaccinated recently. And guess what? Uh, some of those people are going to get neuroophthalmologic problems, just like they would have if they didn't get vaccinated. So. Whenever someone has something happen after a vaccine, um, they will ask me, uh, is, you know, I had the vaccine a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, or maybe not a year, eight months ago. Could it be related to the vaccine? And I say, you know, anything's possible. We know the vaccines crank up your immune system. But again, without having really big data about how commonly we see these manifestations after the vaccine, we can't, we have, we can't compare it to what do we normally see? What was it like before the pandemic? Because again, I practice exclusively neuroophthalmology all day, every day. I see patients with all of these findings. I don't think I'm seeing them any more frequently. And so I don't think we know the answer um, to is the vaccine causative? We know that just in historically any vaccine, and that's what I tell patients, any vaccine is designed to crank up your immune system and you could potentially have uh, um, a neuro-ophthalmologic manifestation related. Andy, a question for you. How do you examine a patient with unilateral sudden midriasis? So when you have an acute uh, dilated pupil midriasis, of course, you have to make sure that's not a third nerve palsy first. That's making sure the lid and the motility are full. But if it's clearly just the pupil, then the normal things are something wrong with your iris, something wrong with the junction because it's pharmacologically blocked or an acute adystonic pupil. So those are kind of the three things. So the first thing is making sure it's not a third. If it's clearly just an isolated medriasis, then you have to decide whether it's the the muscle, the junction, that slit lamp, make sure there's no uveitis, usual things. The most common things that I see from a pharmacologic dilation are scopolamine patches and inadvertent exposure to either plants or drops of some kind. And you can test for that if it's a pharmacologically blocked with a, a parasympathalytic with pilocarpine 1%. In the adystonic people, we use one tenth percent pilo to see if there's denervation supersensitivity, but because that takes a little bit of time in the acute setting, that might not work. Uh, and we're going to look for the usual things in adystonic pupil: the light near dissociation, the vermiform movements, the sector paresis, and most of the time, it doesn't matter because if it's pharmacologically dilated, pharmacologically dilated it'll just go away. If it's adystonic pupil, it will declare itself over time to be adystonic pupil, and uh, if it's something in your iris, you can see that on the slip line. Shalomo, if I could just add a comment about the dilated pupil. We have a paper um, submitted about, there's a, I'm not sure about worldwide, but in the U.S. there's a new drug. And it's called Cubrexa glycopyrium, which um, is for uh, hyperhidrosis, for sweating. It's an ointment you, you rub on your armpits, basically, and that can cause medriasis. So we've seen several patients and we have some number of cases that are being reported of unilateral or bilateral medriasis following this new hyperhidrosis medication ointment that's available, at least in the United States. Now, uh, another question for you. Uh, would you do a second vaccination if the first one caused neurological symptoms like... Uh, whatever. Yeah. So if you had a, let's say you had double vision, you know, a week after the first vaccination um, and looked like a third nerve palsy or, if, or more likely a sixth nerve palsy, would you have the second dose? Um, I, well, of course, the first thing to say is there's no evidence base for, to provide an answer for that. In other words, I don't, 
I don't know the answer. I don't know what might happen. I think most, I tell most patients that I certainly can't guarantee you you won't have the same thing happen if you have another, uh, under the second dose of the vaccine. Um, and I, I think I would tell the patient, listen, you're gonna have to make your own decision because I don't have a, a way to advise you using what, what we try to use, which is evidence-based medicine. I think most patients probably wouldn't themselves would choose not to. I've had that come up twice so far, not a, lot, not, not a large number, and they, they both have decided not to have the second dose. Now, they've asked me, what about a second dose of one of the other uh, vaccines? Not the same vaccine. I said, well, we really don't know anything about that. Um, so I, again, I, I, can't, I, I can't give them a, you have to do this or you don't have to do this. I tell them it's going to be up to you. And the good news is if it went away the first time, probably go away the second time. <laughs> That's a nice, <laughs> it's a nice one. Uh, Andy, a very quick question. What would be a nice pearl for you of differentiating a uh, new onset of diplopia in a uh, myasthenic patient? So myasthenia is characterized by variability and fatigue. So we'd like to get that kind of history out of them if we can. Um, I like to ask them if it's worse at the end of the day or better in the morning when they first wake up. And we tell them to take selfies of whatever they see. So if it's ptosis or diplopia, we selfie, 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 morning, lunch, and evening, and see if we can demonstrate that variability and fatigue. And of course, um, you have to have no peas, no pain, no pupil involvement, no proptosis, no perception loss, no paresthesia, no lees peas allowed. If you have any of those, it's not myasthenia. And often the ptosis can be tested with the rest test or the ice test. If it's diplopia, uh, we don't really have a good ice or rest test equivalent, but we do try it on them to see if it will get better. Um, sometimes it's difficult to tell. I always say it could always be the nerve, the muscle, or the junction. And so you need to be thinking about myasthenia and any unexplained pattern of ophthalmoplegia as long as no peas are present. Do you do tension on tests? I don't do the Tensilon anymore. We, we, the ice test and the rest test kind of took over everything for, for us. Thank you, Andy. Uh, will this, we'll close the Q and A uh, session. And uh, oh, we'll can, now... I, can I, can I just step in as, as the second moderator in, in transition here to explain to our audience that Gordon Platt was unable to be here for the many questions that you asked about his talk. Uh, if, uh, if, if you have no objection, Shlomo, let me take one of the questions that I think many of the audience members were sensitive to, and that's the difference between the aura of epilepsy, uh, occipital epilepsy, and the aura of migraine. And uh, at least for me, uh, I, I, I think we should say that you sometimes cannot tell, so you have to be a little bit on guard that, the, that you can't make that distinction. And Gordon Plant uh, pointed to an article that he had written in which a lesion of the occipital lobe had produced migraine-like uh, aura. So that's the first point. However, you can use, I think, three things that are helpful in distinguishing migraine. One is the duration, and, and Gordon mentioned this, the duration of the aura namely lasting up to 20 to 30 minutes. That is unusual in epileptic aura. It's, absolutely, it's not out of the question, but it's unusual. The second is color. If you hear that the patient has a colored scintillation, a colored hallucination, that will point you in the direction of epilepsy. It does occur in migraine, but it's extremely rare. And the third thing is the traveling wave that, you, that he described as the traveling wave of Dr. Liao from Brazil. That is much more typical of migraine than it is of epilepsy. The problem there is that somehow people who have lesions that are in the occipital lobe can sometimes evoke a migraine aura. So you're still not off the hook. And where we usually make the important distinction is if you've had more than one episode on the same side, you have to be at least um, thinking of the idea that this could be a structural abnormality rather than migraine. If you hear that it went from one side to the other side, 
then that is a big uh, sign of relief. And you don't have to worry so much about, about this being a lesion. Remember, these are tumors and uh, or malformations. And so uh, you have to be thinking. So Shlomo, I think you want me to go into the second part now. And okay. I'm, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm, I'm Jonathan Trobe, and I'm coming to you from the University of Michigan. And I'm going to speak to you about the swollen optic disc and here we Good morning, everyone. This is Jonathan Trobe. I'm speaking to you from Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is in the Midwestern part of the United States. And my topic today is the swollen optic disc. I have formulated this as a dance in five steps, which means that you will have five steps to approach the formulation of the swollen optic disc. The first thing that we have to clear up is language. Uh, in English, when we say swollen, we usually mean that the optic disc is edematous. And that will mean that the patient has an acquired process. If we use the term elevated, that could mean either a congenital or an acquired process. So you can see that there is a distinction here. In general, most physicians, most ophthalmologists use the term swollen. The problem is that if you use that term, you are automatically implying that the patient has an acquired process and you all know that many swollen discs actually are congenital. So I suggest to you that an alternative, not always very popular, but a little bit more rigorous, is using the term anomalous optic disc elevation when you mean congenital and acquired optic disc elevation when you mean acquired. All right, well, let's, with those terms in mind, let's get to the first step of the analysis. And obviously the first step is whether or not the, the optic disc elevation is congenital, because if it is, clearly the workup is going to be very much different. Uh, what, you, what you know and what I know about congenital optic disc elevation is that the patient typically has no visual symptoms. And this is a finding that is, is made incidentally in your office. The patient can have monocular or binocular optic disc elevation, and visual function will usually be normal. That is not always true, and you know the major exception here is optic disc drusen, which can be um, very important in, uh, in, in damaging visual function. But the general rule is visual function will usually be normal. The question is whether ophthalmoscopy itself is enough to help you decide whether or not the disc is congenitally elevated or has acquired optic disc elevation, and do you need to have ancillary imaging? So let me show you in the next slide uh, a series of two pictures here, the one on the left and the one on the right, and I would ask you to look at them and determine just from looking at them which one is congenital and which one is acquired. And I will tell you that there's one of each. All right, after giving it a moment's look here, I'm sure you will be, will agree with me that this is a very difficult assessment. It turns out that the one on the left is congenital and the one on the right is acquired. So let us talk briefly about the signs of congenital optic disc elevation. Well, the first feature is that the nerve fiber layer is generally distinct. And here is that example showing you that if you looked at the margins of the optic discs, you would generally see that they have a distinct border. You know that that's not always the case and it can be very difficult. So we move on to the next feature, which is that typically the congenital optic disc does not have a physiologic cup. And here, you can see that there is no physiologic cup in the center. And we often speak of the elevation as being dome shaped rather than as Americans would say, donut shaped. So that there's a depression in the center. A depression in the center, which is a little bit visible here, is somewhat more typical of acquired optic disc elevation. Again, you can see that the distinction is not always easy. 
The optic disc vessels in congenital optic disc elevation are often tortuous, and there are often too many of them. And you can see that shown here, where the optic disc uh, vasculature looks like it's excessive. And that's because there are vascular anomalies that go along with the optic disc elevation. Spontaneous venous pulsations may be present, but are typically not present in either condition. If you do see spontaneous venous pulsations, you know that you are at least not dealing with increased intracranial pressure. No leakage on fluorescein angiogram in papilledema, uh, I'm sorry, in congenital optic disc elevation, and there will be some typically in papilledema. So that is a helpful distinction. Drusen, uh, as you know, are often present, but the rule is that many congenitally optic disc, many congenitally optic anomalously, congenitally anomalous optic discs do not have optic disc drusen, so don't expect to always find them. But if you are in the search for optic disc drusen, you have a choice of several ancillary studies. And here I'm showing you the four favorite ancillary studies that are used. Fluorescence, autofluorescence photography, which you can see is really quite effective in showing you optic distrusion, even those that are buried. Uh, B-scan ultrasound is quite good. Computed tomography, you can see the, the little white dots here of the uh, calcified drusen in the optic disc. And then the most effective of all, optic coherence tomography, which nowadays is the favorite uh, tool because it's readily available and will give you the answer quite readily. One point to keep in mind here is that the optic disc uh, of, of myopia, which is tilted often, uh, can uh, masquerade as acquired optic disc elevation. You have to be very careful. Keep uh, in mind that it's usually on the nasal side, but this uh, will be a major confounder. All right, now we're ready for step two. If indeed you believe that the optic disc elevation is acquired, your job is to try to figure out what caused it. And let me briefly comment on the important causes of acquired optic disc elevation. So number one is increased intracranial pressure, which we call papilledema, and you know that that is always important, and I'll speak about that in just a moment. The second is obviously infarction of the optic disc, which creates swelling of the, of the, of the axons in the optic disc and in the extracellular space. And ischemic optic neuropathy, as you know, comes in two varieties, and surely you know about that, and we'll probably hear more about that in other uh, talks in this webinar series. The third cause is inflammation, and that generally goes under the rubric of optic neuritis, neuroretinitis, and posterior uveitis. Keep in mind that posterior uveitis is certainly a cause of inflammation of the optic disc, which is right in the middle of the action. The fourth cause is infiltration, and you can see that I have rather poetically tried to make all of these causes begin with the letter I as a way of helping you remember. Infiltration of the optic disc is caused by cancer and also by protein in this condition known in English as poem syndrome. The fifth cause is indentation, and you can see I'm stretching things a little bit to keep the eyes here. Uh, and that would be by a compressive mass in the orbit or the optic canal. That is where you will get most of your, the swelling of the optic disc, either in the, proxim or the, the distal orbit near the globe or in the optic canal where there is no uh, room for, for stretching uh, of, the, of the mass. All right, and then number six is inherited, and that would be labor hereditary optic neuropathy. It produces optic disc swelling as well. Usually the swelling is not in the disc itself, but in the peripapillary axonal layer. Increased blood pressure, well, yes. Uh, malignant uh, systemic hypertension produces vasogenic edema of the optic disc. And although it isn't very prominent and certainly much less prominent than the retinal abnormalities, it is a cause of acquired optic disc elevation and needs to be recognized. Number eight is increased venous retinal venous pressure, which comes from a retinal vein occlusion. And there again, you will see much more prominent retinal findings, and that's the clue that this problem is emanating from the retinal veins. 
Well, the last one I couldn't get under an eye. This one is decreased intraocular pressure. And you, I think, are familiar with the fact that ocular hypotony can cause in elevation of the optic disc. All right, let's move on now to step number three. And the question here is, you, is whether this could be papilledema. And the, the question I have for you is, how do you decide? And we teach that there are two ways that you should be able to distinguish papilledema. Number one, papilledema is usually binocular and symmetrical in the two eyes. And you know that that rule is violated, but basically it is a rule. And if you uh, are seeing a monocular uh, disc elevation or markedly asymmetric elevation, you have to question whether it's papilledema. The other and very important feature is that papilledema, by its very nature, allows visual function to be relatively preserved, especially visual acuity, uh, unless there are two features of the papilledema that are present, and they are, number one, that the papilledema has become atrophic. That is, that the axons have died, and as a result, the optic disc uh, is no longer um, providing visual function. And that would be an exception to the rule that papilledema preserves visual function. And here's an example of optic discs that are simply destroyed from longstanding axoplasmic stasis. All right, the second uh, rule is, or the second uh, feature is that papilledema, when it is very severe, can cause vision loss, either because the axons are no longer working, still present, but not working, and fluid has leaked from the optic disc into the macula, and that causes a disturbance of vision. So those are the two things to keep in mind when you are trying to distinguish papilledema as the cause of acquired optic disc elevation. And here is a picture of that kind of very horrid papilledema that can give rise to a retinal cause of, of uh, vision loss or where the axons have been so badly damaged that the vision is no longer preserved. All right, step number four is always the question of how quickly must you refer a patient with papilledema? And the answer to that, I think you all know, and that is as soon as possible. And the reason for that is that papilledema uh, is, um, has many serious underlying causes which require prompt diagnosis and treatment. In some cases, the treatment does not have to be uh, emergent, but certainly the patient feels that it ought to be. So you have to Keep that in mind. Now, here are the causes of papilledema. A comment about each one. I believe idiopathic intracranial hypertension uh, requires no explanation. You're quite familiar with it. It's pretty much the ophthalmologist papilledema. Brain mass effect certainly can cause it. You know, brain tumors or hemorrhages or subdural hematomas can certainly do this. But generally speaking, they have to be quite large before they will produce papilledema, unless they are also obstructing uh, ventricular uh, outflow, uh, in which case uh, they can be, if properly situated, uh, where they're blocking the outflow of cerebrospinal fluid, then yes, they can certainly uh, be small and cause papilledema. The fourth cause is dural venous sinus obstruction, which is something you must not forget. It's a very effective cause of increased intracranial pressure. If you block the venous outflow to the brain, you will get papilledema. Meningoencephalitis uh, can be indolent, it can be chronic and not very symptomatic. And that's one of the reasons why uh, lumbar puncture is so often performed in patients with papilledema. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, head injury, neck mass, and spinal cord tumor. Those are com less common causes for ophthalmologists, but they're always in the mix when it comes to thinking about papilledema. Spinal cord tumor is a very odd and, and rare cause but you have to consider it. And so is a neck mass, because again, the veins have to drain through the neck and you have to keep that in mind. Very often, uh, the imaging that is done for papilledema does not include these two features. And so it, it, they, it'll be, the diagnosis will be missed. All right, if it's not papilledema, what else could it be? And I'm, I've listed the conditions here and I've bolded the ones that you really have to have at the top of your list. Obviously, arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy which we uh, generally know as giant cell arteritis, that diagnosis has to be made immediately. Non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy is a common cause of 
unilateral or bilateral optic disc elevation. That diagnosis is not urgent, but certainly the distinction between number one and number two is one that you have to make. We are thinking more and more these days about atypical optic neuritis with the discovery of MOG and NMO, and occasionally you can see quite a, a deal of optic disc elevation in these conditions. And the thinking nowadays is that early treatment may be important. Infiltration by cancer is a diagnosis you don't want to miss because uh, patients will certainly hold it against you if there has been a delay in diagnosis, even if, uh, medically speaking, the, the uh, diagnosis is not urgent. Orbital compressive lesions, we've talked about before, they can certainly be causes, usually unilateral, but in Graves' disease, bilateral optic disc elevation. And there again, diagnosis is important and urgent. Posterior uveitis, don't, don't forget posterior uveitis as a cause. Central retinal vein occlusion, we've talked about. Acute systemic hypertension, this is something that really can be very dangerous to the patient. Labor hereditary optic neuropathy and POEM syndrome. These are the somewhat less common causes. Okay, now what else looks like papilledema? And there are two main uh, things that I've boxed for you here that you must keep in mind as being difficult to distinguish from papilledema. And here you can see, just by looking at the optic disc, there would be no way for you to know that this isn't papilledema, and this happens to be ischemic optic neuropathy. So keep in mind that that's ophthalmoscopically a very difficult distinction. And what about this one? This is papillitis or optic neuritis. You know, the optic disc has only a limited number of, or limited repertoire for what it can display to you. So what I would say to you about this is do not depend on ophthalmoscopy alone rely on history and visual function measurements in your distinction between papilledema and other causes of the acquired swollen optic disc. All right, so I've come to the end and uh, I wanna summarize these points for you and leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. So point number one is distinguish congenital from acquired optic disc elevation. That is very important. If you shove everybody into the same workup, you're going to be doing an, an awful lot of unnecessary testing of patients with, this, with the elevated optic disc. Number two, decide if you need ancillary imaging to confirm a congenital cause. I would say that most ophthalmologists are in the habit of getting ancillary testing because they're not sure, they're not confident. I think that's perfectly reasonable. I think the more experience you have with this, the more you can get away with not doing ancillary imaging. It has become quite convenient nowadays to just get OCT, and I think that's perfectly acceptable. If you think you can do it without it, then for sure, skip that step. If it's acquired, and you really think that it is acquired, you have certain things on the top of your list. Obviously, papilledema is very important, but also arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy and atypical optic neuritis. Those are the big three, and I would say uh, in pretty much in that order, although arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, your job is to prevent further vision loss and other systemic consequences, so early diagnosis, absolutely critical. The fourth point is that papilledema requires prompt imaging. You cannot delay the diagnosis, even though the, the, it may not be, it may be idiopathic intracranial hypertension of, of rather chronic duration, and not in need of urgent diagnosis, but you don't know that uh, beforehand. Uh, we typically say that CT scan is a nice screening tool, but MRI scan is what you really need here. So it's gonna be getting the patient to the scanner, to the MRI scanner as soon as possible, which might mean through an emergency room. And then the next point is that arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy requires immediate steroid treatment and biopsy. At least in the United States, we always uh, entertain uh, and perform a biopsy in these patients for confirmation. I know that in Europe that is not always done, but uh, at least here it is. And finally, atypical optic neuritis could be MOG. It could also be NMO, although MOG is somewhat more likely. And I believe you're going to be hearing more about these, these uh, newer forms uh, or more newly recognized forms of atypical optic neuritis. There are other forms of atypical optic neuritis besides MOG that you need to know about and uh, again, uh, need to pursue the workup and get on it relatively quickly. So that is all I have to say to you. Um, I hope this has been informative and that you've learned a little something and I look forward to, uh, to hearing your, your feedback.
you, John, for your excellent presentation, as always. And uh, we will now move to our next speaker, will be Misha Pless, who will discuss uh, optic neuritis and other optic neuropathy. Misha. Good morning. Thank you very much for this invitation to speak at the Society webinar. Uh, my topic is optic neuritis and other optic neuropathies. Thank you to Shlomo Dutton for this invitation. I am going to be discussing a very, very large topic, the essence of which is distinguishing typical versus atypical optic neuritis. As a neuroophthalmologist, we are busy trying to decide which um, optic neuritis we're dealing with. The typical optic neuritis is um, most people treating eye patients will know is a young patient that has monocular acute or subacute loss of vision. Uh, typically, if it's bilateral, you, there is no relative afferent pupillary defect, but when it's unilateral, there is, as a rule, a relative afferent pupillary defect. In the majority of cases, there is pain on eye movement and the optic nerve head is normal. A swollen optic nerve head, and here I mean a slightly swollen optic nerve head, is present in about a third of the patient, so it's a minority. And there is spontaneous improvement over time in 90% of patients and the improvement is slow. The more tricky cases are the atypical cases, which may be bilateral, they may be slow and painless in development. So here is a key, painful versus painless. There might be ocular inflammation, such as uveitis, a macular star, or severe disc edema. And there is sometimes no improvement without treatment. The patients might be older, and there could be a systemic illness associated. And here, the key is that these are cases that are steroid sensitive. So you give steroids, the patient improves quickly. And if you withdraw steroids, the situation worsens considerably. Red desaturation as a rule is present in the cases of optic neuritis. It's a sine qua non for optic neuritides. And the loss of vision is rather central than peripheral. So that's another key to the typical optic neuritis central loss of vision versus peripheral loss of vision, important to recognize. Loss of contrast sensitivity has been reported to be one of the classic findings in the typical as well as atypical optic neuritis, but it's not specific for any um, type of optic neuropathy. Ischemic optic neuropathies will also report uh, patients with this disease will report a loss of contrast vision. That means that the interface between black and white is washed out. And that's, uh, um, that could happen in patients that have, for instance, 20-20 uh, vision, 100% vision, like visual acuity. This is a fundus photo of a patient with optic neuritis, retrobulbar optic neuritis. That means the optic nerve head on examination looks normal or only minimally swollen. And this is, as a rule, one of the classic findings in retrobulbar optic neuritis. The old saying, a little bit ironic, the doctor sees nothing, the patient sees nothing. And of course, that is the sine qua non of an inflamed optic nerve. A bulbar or anterior optic neuritis patient will show some swelling. But here, the swelling is not severe. Uh, hemorrhages, in the, uh, uh, as a rule, are uh, a, a feature that will point toward an atypical case or an ischemic optic neuropathy rather than optic neuritis. The differential diagnosis for optic neuritis or optic neuropathies is large. This is pretty much the most important slide that I'm going to show that when there is loss of vision due to optic nerve lesions, one has to keep this differential diagnosis in mind. And I tend to think of it in terms of four different categories. The top right category is the category that um, characterizes the patients that we see the most, demyelinating variants, neuromyelitis optica. I will speak about that in a moment. And the bottom right are the cases that we see uh, that we don't uh, forget, ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, 
uh, mitochondrial labor, hereditary optic neuropathy, and tumors. On the left side are the uh, atypical cases or the less frequent situations that we see, for instance, infections. And here's a list that I can make available to you. Um, if needed, the bacterial infections such as syphilis, Lyme, uh, Bartonella, very rarely tuberculosis, but also with the advent of viral infections, we are seeing reports, for instance, of coronavirus infections of the optic nerve, very, very seldom, but certainly varicella zoster, herpes zoster, uh, human immune deficiency virus, and so forth. Uh, fungi occasionally will be associated with, um, with optic neuropathies here, uh, uh, mucormycosis and aspergillus, and occasionally parasites like nematodes or protozoa like toxoplasma will affect the optic nerve. Rarely do we see uh, post-infectious or autoimmune optic neuritides that are associated with other illnesses or with events such as a vaccine uh, or a vaccine that has been given and it could give rise to an autoimmune attack on the optic nerve, uh, bee sting associated, as well as uh, focal infections. And here we're talking sinusitis with adjacent infection of the optic nerve, as well as systemic inflammation, such as Bechet's disease, rider, sarcoid, lupus, could be sometimes associated with optic um, uh, neuritis. Ischemic optic neuropathy is a category of optic nerve disease that we always keep in mind. The patient typically is someone with vascular risk factors, wakes up with loss of vision, altitudinal visual field defect, like demonstrated on this slide, either superior or inferior characterizes the visual field defect. The loss of vision is typically central and not peripheral, and the optic nerve demonstrates segmental swelling that corresponds to the altitudinal visual field defect. Flame hemorrhages and a hyperemic optic nerve are very typical for an ischemic optic neuropathy. Occasionally, we'll see patients with disc edema that have associated enlarged veins. The old name for this is papilloflebitis or optic periphlebitis. I would say this is a patient with an optic neuritis or an optic neuropathy of any type in an optic nerve head that is tight. The neuroocular junction is small and the veins dilate secondarily. So this is not a diagnosis in and of itself per se. Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy and the four mutations that are often quoted a very important differential diagnosis for optic neuritis and optic neuritides. Uh, the uh, patient is typically a young male, but not necessarily exclusively, that uh, um, experiences dramatic loss of vision in one eye and several weeks or months later in the fellow eye. Uh, the optic nerve is slightly swollen on fluorescein angiogram. There is no staining. That's a very important point. And on direct examination, one sees telangiectatic vessels, vessels sprouting or occasionally already optic atrophy or cupping. And one then looks for the genetic mutations that characterize this disorder. When the radiologist calls us up and tells us that there is enhancement of the optic nerve sheath. We think of infiltrating diseases such as sarcoid, tuberculosis, and lymphoma. Here, the radiology is very helpful because it will show us that the optic nerve sheath is inflamed and not the optic nerve itself. One has to worry about the optic nerve um, uh, at the apex, at the apex, so the, um, uh, the uh, um, uh, canal it can sometimes uh, hide, if you will, lesions such as uh, uh, granulomas, uh, tumors, uh, metastatic disease. So a careful examination of the uh, imaging is very important in cases that show um, uh, not only optic nerve lesions, but also adjacent uh, nerve involvement, such as uh, could be with the uh, when, when sees an optic uh, uh, 
a nerve fat associated with an ophthalmoplegia. So the canal, the optic canal, is a very important point. One needs to, uh, as, a, as a treating physician, look at one's own radiology and examine the optic canal very carefully because small tumors may hide in the canal. When a macular star um, is uh, an accompanying finding of an optic neuritis or an optic nerve head swelling, one has to ask oneself uh, whether or not there has been a cat um, a scratch involved. And even when there is no cat scratch, um, uh, the patient doesn't have any memory of having been scratched, then one has to test for Bartonella. And a treatment with steroids and antibiotics could help um, uh, improve visual outcome. Uh, proptosis or ptosis or other orbital findings should alert the physician to an optic neuropathy that is associated with uh, compression, either meningioma, an optic nerve head uh, glioma, uh, or an other type of tumor that involves the optic nerve and the orbit causing exophthalmus, like is shown in this case, needs to be thought of very carefully in, in the appropriate imaging done. Now, recurrent or alternating optic neuritis or sequential optic neuritis should raise the flag of an autoimmune optic neuritis. And that is the spectrum of uh, neuromyelitis optica. There is, of course, an explosion of both knowledge due to great publications uh, associated with neuromyelitis optica. Here, it's very important to, to uh, identify this disease because the key here is preventing future events, future attacks, but also the transverse myelitis that is so debilitating in neuromyelitis optica. These are not associated with multiple sclerosis, and the uh, disease here has been now um, a thought of as a manifestation of an autoimmune process. And here, very important, very important to keep in mind that there are now three separate diseases or disease entities that have been identified. And I'm just going to summarize this as a topic that uh, warrants uh, several lectures, but very briefly, I can say that there is neuromyelitis optica associated with the aquaporin-4 antibody. There is MOG, MOG uh, associated disease, which is linked to the MOG antibody. And then there is the uh, so-called idiopathic chronic relapsing immune optic neuritis. Uh, all of these can cause uh, sequential optic neuritis or um, bilateral simultaneous optic neuritis with severe involvement. Now, here we're looking at the longitudinal transverse myelitis that um, um, characterizes uh, the uh, uh, not very um, uh, much wished for um, sequela of this disease needs to be prevented at all costs. These are the four different manifestations of neuromyelitis optica, sequential bilateral optic neuritis, longitudinally extensive myelitis, severe optic neuritis, steroid responsive, and recurrent optic neuritis. So when these um, present, think please of autoimmune processes. The radiology helps us tremendously. I will show you in sequence the uh, T2 sequence um, that shows um, signal change in the optic nerve here on the right side. Again, in the apex, signal change in the optic nerve, which is important to recognize and is very helpful in the diagnosis. And uh, gadolinium enhancement, here's T1 with, uh, that shows an enhancing optic nerve on the right side, classic of optic neuritis. It is a good and important exclusion for other ischemic optic neuropathies. Here again, a gadolinium enhanced optic nerve, right side again, here magnified, which shows clearly the difference between the right and the left side, not only as a way to uh, enforce the diagnosis or um, strengthen the diagnosis, but to um, exclude other possibilities. Here are the axials and coronals of a given patient with severe optic neuritis associated with neuromyelitis optica. 
one has to remember that the optic nerve continues intracranially before it joins the chiasm. And here is a lesion in the intracranial course of the optic nerve, sometimes missed even by uh, experienced radiologist. Here again, an intracranial optic nerve that shows signal change. And of course, the chiasm um, is an area of the brain that uh, has all the visual pathways that come together. And if the slices of the MRI are thick enough, you might miss an inflammation or enhancement or even a tumor of the optic chiasm. These lesions then characterize the presence of multiple sclerosis, which is a sequela of um, uh, optic neuritis, typical optic neuritis, and needs to be recognized because the treatment of multiple sclerosis uh, early enough can uh, offer a very good prognosis for patients. T1 black holes correlate with T2 changes, very important to recognize and to correlate. These are the classic Dawson's fingers, and the sagittal flare, which are important to look for in patients with optic neuritis. Uh, here, the uh, concomitant T1 black holes and the lesions of MS, which are very characteristic. Uh, the last slide is um, if one has a typical optic neuritis case and sees no lesions on MRI, the risk of multiple sclerosis is approximately 20% over five to 10 years. One lesion on MRI increases that risk to 50%, two or more lesions on MRI. Uh, that uh, in some cases is equivalent to the diagnosis of MS, depending on what one finds on the uh, spine and the spinal fluid. I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Misha. We're going to go on now to our last speaker. Nick Volpe is, uh, is a, a, a wonderful neuro-ophthalmologist who is now the chair of the ophthalmology department at uh, Northwestern University in Chicago. He was educated on the East Coast, uh, was formerly at the University of Pennsylvania. He had originally received some training in Boston. He is really a, a master and I am sure he will give you some very good information about giant cell arteritis. Hello, and welcome to the SOE webinar, Neuro-Ophthalmology Series. My name is Nicholas Volpe, and I'll be talking to you about giant cell arteritis from a beautiful Friday morning in Chicago. I'm excited to speak on this topic because not only will we review the classic presentations of giant cell arteritis and the importance of this diagnosis in all neuroophthalmic conditions, but also I'll have the opportunity to share some new approaches to diagnosis and of course the new opportunities for treatment with tocilizumab. I have no financial disclosures relevant to this presentation. I receive equity ownership in a company that works with OCT, but I will not be discussing that. So first and important is to consider the context of this condition and who gets it. This condition is almost exclusively in the Northern Hemisphere. Populations of Anglo-Saxon origin, lighter skinned individuals are more prone to this condition. There are certain HLA types that have shown up in different populations. It may be related to where more older patients are, but there very, there very well may be an environmental factor, either related to infectious agents or possibly sunlight that contribute to the development of the disorder. And notably, the incidence is increasing. The exception to this, of course, uh, here's a series of patients that were reported by myself and a number of other co-authors that di identified giant cell arteritis in patients of African-American or black descent. Interestingly, this group had a higher incidence of headache and eye pain and a lower incidence of typical draw claudication, which I'll discuss in a moment, which is one of my uh, most important predictors of patients who have temporal or giant cell arteritis. Risk factors by far the most important is older. This diagnosis is on the top of your list in any patient, uh, particularly over age 75, but even as you get older into the 80s and 90s, any type of neuroptomic presentation whether it's vision loss or double vision, should have uh, temporal arteritis in the differential diagnosis. 
Uh, definitely the possibility that some type of triggering arterial disease. Uh, there are some reports that suggest that smoking is a risk factor that allows a potential, for instance, viral pathogen or other entity to trigger the inflammatory response in the blood vessels. Uh, one epidemiologic study showed that former pregnancy is protective. And there have been a number of interesting uh, reports in populations in which the listed entities, parvovirus, bird keeping, adenovirus, RSV, and others, uh, might be risk factors for this condition. Symptoms, of course, headache. Uh, headache is an unusual symptom in an elderly patient that doesn't have headaches. So as soon as you elicit a history of headache, you have to consider temporal arteritis. Two thirds of the patients have new headaches, but accident, actually because our diagnostic threshold and our sensitivity to this condition and its unusual presentations, the actual prevalence of headaches is decreasing because people are recognizing the disorder under other circumstances. Usually the pain is in the scalp and over the temporal, artery, temporal arteries, and it could be mild or severe. Uh, occasionally it's intermittent, but most of the time it's persistent. And again, as I mentioned, jaw claudication, which is not TMJ, it's not I open my mouth, it's when I chew, I progressively get more pain in my jaw, my throat, my tongue, uh, as I'm trying to eat, for instance, chewing a piece of meat. <clears throat> Importantly, uh, many and most patients, as we think about how we distinguish this from non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, those that develop arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, the vast majority have prodromal symptoms. Unfortunately, that majority is only 75%. And there will be 25%, which I'll talk about in a minute, of patients who really are presenting with isolated neurovisual presentations that actually have a cult giant cell with the absence of other symptoms. The classic ones, as mentioned, the headache, scalp tendon, and jaw claudication, fever, weight loss, malaise, polymyalgia symptoms, muscle pain. Those are all important systemic symptoms. And of course, anybody who has double vision for a few hours and it goes away, transient vision loss and it goes away, and then goes on to develop a more uh, catastrophic event uh, with this type of ocular prodrome has giant cell until proven otherwise. About 50% of patients will present with uh, visual symptoms. Uh, the most common, of course, is vision loss in the setting of ischemic optic neuropathy. But about a third will have transient vision loss prior to developing their event. These, in my opinion, are some of the most critical patients to try to recognize in your practice that are presenting with vision that recovers uh, in the backdrop of temporal arteritis, because these patients could potentially be saved. Double vision and eye pain are other symptoms. In patients that we call, quote, occult GCA, again, these are patients who don't have a lot of other systemic symptoms. Uh, it can represent between 20 and 25%. Uh, the sed rate and C-reactive protein uh, are often uh, abnormal, but maybe less abnormal, again, presumably because the disease is less widespread in terms of its symptoms. Obviously, these are all visual presentations in uh, this classic paper by Hayray. Uh, but you can see, again, about a third with amaurosis and 100% with some type of vision loss, most commonly ischemic optic neuropathy. <clears throat> Perhaps one of the most important clues in the patients with vision loss to uh, the fact that it's arteritic or giant cell based is the fact that vision loss is almost always severe. Uh, as you can see from this bar graph, uh, 2200 and worse for the vast majority of patients. Uh, and in fact, if you have count fingers, hand motions, light perception vision in someone with ischemic optic neuropathy that you're trying to decide whether it could be arteritic, almost always favors arteritic when the vision loss is severe. Uh, remember that the vision loss can also affect the retinal circulation. And perhaps one of the more important points I'd like to make is that if you're not finding significant fundus findings, in other words, swollen optic nerve or artery occlusion, but you do have catastrophic vision loss in an elderly person, the presumption there is that this is posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, and that is giant cell until proven otherwise. <clears throat> so 80%, uh, I showed a different slide a little earlier that it was about 90%. Uh, there's a combination uh, of uh, artery and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, optic nerve and retinal ischemia presentation. I'll show an example of that. That's almost always a giant cell arteritis of less than 10%, but a significant minority will have this posterior ischemic version. And again, a frank ocular ischemic syndrome can develop uh, in a small percentage of patients. Uh, here's a nice uh, uh, and recent uh, summary patient uh, paper about the various findings and symptoms in a cohort uh, 
of giant cell arteritis patients. Um, you can uh, take a minute and look carefully at these uh, slides in terms of the prevalence of the uh, symptoms, but you can see that uh, things like uh, the new onset of headache and scalp tenderness, uh, temporal artery tenderness, those are present in a significant number of patients in the 70 to 80 percent range. Uh, in this particular series, interestingly, about 40 percent reported fever, so a fever of unknown origin in an older patient uh, is an important symptom to consider. Uh, but again, the, what I want to emphasize here is that these people generally have other symptoms in addition to their neurovisual presentation. Uh, and then in this uh, very nicely demonstrated pie chart, uh, you can see how things break out in terms of the presentations of vision loss, strongly favoring uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy as the most common uh, scenario. <clears throat> Certain, uh, the, in this case, unlike non arteriotic ischemic optic neuropathy, where we're a little less sure uh, exactly what the mechanism is in non arteriotic here, we know that we're dealing with catastrophic infarction of the posterior ciliary vessels or ophthalmic artery, leading to optic nerve ischemia. Uh, and here are some uh, nice examples of uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, very pale swelling, typical of giant cell. Here's a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Uh, with uh, a cotton wool spot. This is a classic presentation uh, for giant cell arteritis. And I'll talk about this again in a minute, but the use of fluorescent angiography to demonstrate choroidal non-perfusion can be a critical diagnostic aid in working through these patients. In my experience, uh, the giant cell arteritis examination uh, often either has this very classic presentation or sometimes there's a paucity of findings in patients with vision loss. So once again, here I show some classic examples of chalky white swelling. Here's that simultaneous ischemic optic neuropathy with branch retinal artery occlusion. Here's posterior ischemic optic neuropathy with just a cotton wool spot. And here's a patient with just some feathery cotton wool spots and maybe a suggestion of choroidal ischemia on exam. So these are all patients that had severe vision loss in the setting of giant cell. In terms of making the diagnosis, as mentioned, the demographics, the, the Older women who are lightly pigmented, that's the most common population. Remember the prodromal symptoms as listed with jaw claudication and scalp tenderness, um, the abnormal artery on exam. Remember that the most potent predictor of not having temporal arteritis is in fact the low SED rate, but unfortunately somewhere between 15 and 20% of patients with giant cell will have a normal sedimentation rate. So you don't get off the giant cell train, so to speak, or making that diagnosis just because of the SED rate. And I would urge you to think about ordering the SED rate with a pretest probability suspicion and decide what you're going to do based on the SED rate before you, SED rate result before you even order it. So if it's less than 50, I'm not going to do anything. If it's between 50 and 75, I'm going to treat them and, and a biopsy. If it's 100, I'm going to admit them to the hospital. Some thinking where you're not, now what do I do? I've got the SED rate. Think about what you're expecting to do based on the test result. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, various studies show normal SED rate in uh, up to 20% of patients. Uh, there is some indication that more SED rate elevation requires, uh, suggests more active disease. The C-reactive protein and platelet count also ordered as complementary tests and uh, helps with false positives and negative SED rate. And obviously, the combination of SED rate and C-reactive protein being both elevated puts your probability in the 90% range. As mentioned and demonstrated in these photographs, this entire choroid is not perfused. This one has uh, non, uh, a lobular non-perfusion areas. I use fluorescein angiograms quite frequently in the distinction of visual presentations of temporal arteritis, because even in some with amaurosis or just some transient visual symptoms, a paucity of findings, don't underestimate the importance of fluorescein angiogram. Uh, here's a contribution I made earlier in my career about the temporal artery biopsy. Uh, before we had alternatives, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, uh, the rule was everybody gets two biopsies. In my experience, uh, we do unilateral biopsies and only follow with a second when there's a high clinical suspicion and a negative on the first. We don't do simultaneous bilateral biopsies. And in fact, uh, based on some of these newer techniques, the first uh, uh, Doppler ultrasonography, which was first reported by Schmidt in the New England Journal in 1997, we are using other methods now to increase our sensitivity and uh, ideas about the screening for giant cell without having to do a biopsy. Uh, and it, it's a very quick and non-invasive test. And 
I believe this is the first test that should be gotten on all patients after the laboratory workup when giant cell is highly suspected. Uh, and it's a very easy finding to make as demonstrated on these slides, these hypoechoic areas uh, around the artery that are really just demonstrating the thickening and infiltrated arterial wall in patients with giant cell. And you can see in various studies when compared to uh, uh, the temporal artery biopsy as the gold standard, there's a fairly good sensitivity and specificity. It gets into the 80 or 90% uh, of course, nothing being 100%. The only thing that's 100% is a good doctor making good decisions based on the um, various amounts and types of information that are available to him or her at the moment. And when in doubt, we treat these patients and, and go towards biopsy. Uh, some newer techniques that have been used, uh, uh, functional uh, MRI scans with uh, tracer elements that show inflammation in the arteries, uh, some exciting uh, sense that these will be very predictive and sensitive and specific. Uh, actually, MRI scan, as seen in these uh, very elegant pictures, uh, can demonstrate uh, true inflammation enhancement of the super superficial temporal arteries. Um, and uh, we're finding that uh, we sometimes stumble upon this when an MRI scan is done for a third nerve palsy or some other reason where the suspicion was low, uh, and we'll look for this and then decide to pursue uh, giant cell arteritis based on these findings. I think this is an excellent summary in this rheumatology article by Point uh, about the approach, and it very much mirrors my approach with the addition of using fluorescent angiography. So this is written by a rheumatologist, so they don't have a visual presentation, uh, but I think this plugs in pretty well in terms of how patients might present to me uh, with a vision loss symptom. And you can see uh, using the ultrasound uh, is, the, is the first step. And if it's negative uh, and uh, the suspicion is low, you can stop there. And then if it's higher, then you can decide on biopsy or one of these other methods. Uh, if it's positive and high, uh, I'm done uh, because that patient, if I'm pretty sure they have it and I get the ultrasound, then I will treat this patient without a biopsy. And then if it's low or medium, again, potentially using fluorescent angiogram or the other diagnostic tests to help you make a decision. <clears throat> Uh, so prompt treatment, of course, uh, anybody who you even think might have this gets treated with steroids and hydration. Uh, we use intravenous steroids when vision loss is present based on some studies that suggest that it works more effectively. I think the most important thing is that the steroids get into the patient. So if they're going to have to sit 12 hours in the emergency room waiting to see a nurse or a doctor to get steroids, then you're better off getting them the pills at a pharmacy. Just get steroids to these patients uh, immediately and as quick as possible long before you make a decision as to whether they definitely have it based on your diagnostic testing. Uh, most patients require treatment for up to two years. Uh, there's a, definitely an increase in fractures and diabetes from the steroid treatment. And until recently, all the alternatives, azathioprine, cyclosporine, uh, which uh, work in some patients, but uh, no good trials had been uh, demonstrated success. <clears throat> and then finally, in the last five years, uh, with targeted treatment against IL-6, which is an inflammatory mediator that is upregulated up -regulated in inflamed arteries in giant cell patients, uh, has been studied and very effectively um, in uh, the uh, last five years demonstrated in a couple of different randomized clinical trials to be highly effective. This is tocilizumab uh, as an adjunct treatment for the, uh, the treatment of giant cell arteritis. So, uh, this is now becoming standard of care. The question is how and when this care is introduced to patients. So this is not a beginning treatment. This is part of the chronic treatment and a desire to get patients off of steroids sooner. And while as an organized community, we don't have specific recommendations, it'll depend on the rheumatologist that you work with, we are, I am finding that I'm introducing tocilizumab much sooner in the treatment of most patients. Um, there are different uh, uh, professional recommendations in different journals about uh, who should get it, and uh, the emphasis, of course, recognizing that steroids go first for sure, uh, and you're not delaying treatment for diagnosis, and then you're introducing tocilizumab, particularly uh, in patients who you need to get off of steroids and in whom this can be done effectively uh, and expeditiously. Uh, and then another excellent uh, editorial and discussion uh, by Alfredo Sedun and Lynn Gordon, kind of going back and forth and when uh, and whether it should routinely be used. And I, I don't have an answer for you except to say that I am using it on a more and more regular basis in combination with my rheumatologist and having very much success in getting patients off of onto lower doses of steroids uh, 
at a much sooner rate. So <clears throat> with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, remind you again that the presentation should be suspected in any patient who's over age 70, uh, less so under age 60. But as you get into 75, 85, if you have vision loss, double vision, or any neuroophthalmic presentation, you should think temporal arteritis. You should use fluorescent angiography. Don't hold treatment for diagnosis. Think about introducing ultrasound and the other diagnostic methods. Thank you very much. Okay, well, that was our last speaker, but we have not finished with the question and answer. And this is Jonathan Trobe speaking. I'm going to take over as the moderator here. Uh, Nick Volpe, are you still there, Nick? I am still here. Okay. Yes, I am still here. here. So we're gonna go right to you first. And I, I have to say that you introduced some things that I think are going to be rather uh, startling to the audience. The first thing is, uh, biopsy. Are, are you backing off from biopsy and saying, I've got better ways that are easier. I'm going to use ultrasound, MRI. G come on, give it to us straight here. Are you, are you really saying we don't need a biopsy? Uh, I don't know that I'm saying that you don't need it. I'm just telling you that this is a very effective alternative, particularly in the scenario where your pretest su su suspicion is low. So I'm finding that I'm doing less negative biopsies because I feel very comfortable based on my clinical acumen, the clinical scenario. If I can pass one of these other tests, then I feel comfortable not stacking up a bunch of negative biopsies. I am not a person who ascribes to, I need to have a biopsy, otherwise I can't treat them because somebody's gonna sue me someday and tell me I got the diagnosis wrong. If I have a strong clinical suspicion and non-invasive diagnostic tests that support like fluorescein and ultrasound, then I will skip a biopsy in a very positive case. And alternatively, I'll use these techniques to make me feel comfortable about ruling it out in a low suspicion case. Well, that's, I think that is, uh, I have to say as the moderator here, and maybe Shlomo, you would pitch in and maybe Misha as well. I think that that is a little bit of a radical departure that most people in the United States at least have leaned on biopsy and have said that they don't trust the other methods, but you're telling us that we should begin to trust some of these other things. You know, I mean, I, none of this has been studied in a way that would ever dismiss the gold standard of the temporary biopsy. And by all means, it's just not that big a deal to do a temporary biopsy. But at least in the, for the consistency and flow that I'm having, I'm getting more and more comfortable using this, particularly working with rheumatologists who see a different subset of patients in using it comfortably to exclude low suspicion cases. And in obviously positive cases that I'm gonna treat anyway, I don't feel like I have to be held to a standard that is a tissue diagnosis when there is no alternative in the clinical scenario. All right, Nick, I'm gonna follow up on that. I know that the rheumatologists and the ophthalmologists are not always in agreement about these kinds of things. And would you, if you had a patient who had what you thought was, well, I'm gonna ask you to tell us, a negative biopsy is a negative biopsy on one side uh, determinate, determine, is it, de it, will it tell you yes, no, I'm going to treat? What do you need to know with a negative biopsy to tell you that I am, I'm either going to override the biopsy result or not? When Again, I just, I, I just, I, I, I think if the clinical scenario is absolutely classic with a white chalky disc and hand motion vision and impaired flow on fluorescein and a sed rate of 100, who cares what the biopsy is? All right, what That's if the sed rate is, what if it's 50? Again, if the clinical scenario is, is consistent and it has all these other findings that I only know in that disease, I don't know it in a non arteritic disease, then I'm gonna to tend to treat. Uh, again, I, you can have that discussion with the patient, I guess, at that point to inform it, but I don't, uh, this is a clinical diagnosis in, every, in, in almost every other scenario in terms of rheumatologists, right? They'll diagnose temporal arteritis based on three criteria from this column and that column and, and feel comfortable needing that treatment. And, I think we have to own up to the uniqueness of the presentation of giant cell. It doesn't mean there aren't very subtle presentations that you have to biopsy to detect it, but in the classic presentation, that's my thinking. All right, is, is, is there a role for the ophthalmologist in treating giant cell arteritis or is it our job to make the diagnosis and turn the patient over? Uh, I think it's very important that you continue to follow the patient, mostly because you have a connection with their symptoms that they presented, 
and to be able to look for subtle findings that might suggest that they're not adequately treated. But in the end, we are not people that should be supervising steroids or tocilizumab on our own. So it really requires a combined effort. I don't think the first two or three weeks matters because you're gonna bomb away with steroids and get things settled down. Uh, but at that point, subsequent to that, I, don't, I certainly don't diagnose and, and never see the patient again because there are other issues and they often have a blind one eye, you wanna monitor the other eye. So I maintain a relationship with the patients. So many of the questions came to you, Nick, and since you're still here, I'm, I'm uh, you gonna have, I am going to have to depart now. So, uh, okay. Well, one last question. Yep. Fluorescein angiography. Yep. Several people wanted to know. You mentioned about choroidal ischemia. When do you get fluorescein angiography in your workup of a patient who might have giant cell? So, in any patient that has an ischemic optic neuropathy presentation, that I think is consistent with giant cell or I'm unsure, or it's one of those marginal cases where the sed rate's not helping me. I think the fluorescein could be very, very helpful in that scenario. Uh, possibly in patients with transient visual symptoms, the fluorescein can be very helpful in that setting if it's transient choroidal ischemia. So those are two classics. And again, if I'm looking to you know, have positive ultrasound in a chalky white swollen disc with hand motions vision, and I wanna just nail it down one more time without a biopsy, I might do it in that scenario. Okay, well, we'll let you go off to see your patients. Um, actually, have well, a great day. Really good. Great you day. handle those questions. Absolutely. I've got some tougher ones for you, but they're but you're going to escape those. All right, uh, Misha. Misha, are you there? No, Misha is not here. Misha is not there. Okay, so uh, then it's going to be up to us, Shlomo, to try to handle some of the things that came up both for my talk and for Misha's talk. Uh, Dr. Dr. Pless's talk, he, uh, several people wanted to know, are we still using the ONTT guidelines, the optic neuritis treatment trial guidelines in the treatment of optic neuritis? And uh, maybe I'll speak first on this. I was involved in the optic neuritis treatment trial um, and, and in the writing of the papers in the New England Journal, so I'm rather familiar with it. Um, I think that, here's my, my overall view of this. In the past, uh, it was always said that the treatment of optic neuritis with steroids was kind of optional. And the reason for that was there's really no very good evidence for, from the optic neuritis treatment trial that the, that stero the treatment is really very much good. It maybe hastens recovery, uh, but not very much. And I don't think you could defend the use of, of corticosteroids in, in the treatment of typical optic neuritis on the basis of that. It's really not very effective. You'd think it ought to be, but it isn't. So now you have to say that you are going to do it partly because the patient wants it or because you want it and because it's logical, but honestly, the evidence is not there. So I think that's the first point to make. The problem is that we now have these other things called MOG and and uh, neuromyelitis optica, where we do think that steroids make a difference. Certainly that is true in NMO, that's neuromyelitis optica. And you may even need more than that, more than steroids. So it's become a complicated thing. It used to be said that, that, that you'd want to uh, treat, it, your, treat optic neuritis uh, if you're an ophthalmologist on your own. Now, I think it's become so complicated that I, my advice to you would be, that if you are an ophthalmologist, you unload that patient as quickly as you can, either to a neuro-ophthalmologist or a neurologist. Be careful with neurologists because they don't know how to examine the eyes most of the time. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trained in neurology and I can tell you that most of my colleagues in neurology don't want any part of the eyes. And so you have to be very careful. Shlomo, what would you say? Well, first of all, we treat all our patients. That's one, with steroids. And the reason would be that uh, nowadays we have also the uh, MOG and the NMO. That's one. And two, uh, we have those patients with neuroimmunology. Neuroimmunology is a new uh, or a, an older subspecialty of neurology, and they take a very good part of the treatment of these patients with us, okay? So uh, we, we play ping pong with uh, 
neuroimmunology, and uh, they do the neuro part and we do the uh, eye part. But we obviously and uh, certainly do treat our patients. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, serology in case of MOG and NMO takes time. And until we get the results, um, the patients are treated. So let me turn to another, to back to the giant cell arteritis. Some of you wanted to know about the role of tocilizumab, which is this IL-6 inhibitor. Uh, I would have to say that the rheumatologists are more enthusiastic about it than the neuro-ophthalmologists, in the United States at least. And the reason for that is that tocilizumab is not a, a very often well-tolerated uh, and it's very expensive. Steroids are not expensive. Tocilizumab is extremely expensive, at least in the United States. And so there have been some questions about its role. I would, I, I would say that uh, I would agree with Dr. Um, Volpe that it, it, you use it in combination with steroids, but certainly not as a replacement for steroids. And uh, many people have found that it is just not as nearly as good as we hoped it would be. I mean, at the moment, I think we are still stuck with steroids. Uh, the, uh, many of you wanted to know how quickly do, do the patients get tapered uh, off their steroids? And that is very controversial. There, there really are not many great guidelines on that. But the rule that I use is I try to get the patients down to around 10 or 15 milligrams of, of prednisone or pre prednisone equivalent oral dose within about a month and a half of the diagnosis. Otherwise, you are submitting your patients to the side effects of chronic steroids and they are plentiful. And you do, you do not want, to, want that to be, to be uh, happening. Another thing that came up here, there were several things that had to do with um, optic disc swelling, which was, was my topic. Uh, one of you asked about nutritional optic neuropathy. Uh, why is that not on the list of the swollen disc? And the answer is that very few cases of nutritional optic neuropathy produce much in the way of swelling of the optic disc. It's a retrobulbar phenomenon, which does not seem to produce much optic disc edema. So I don't think it really belongs on the list. Um, and the same thing would be true of toxic optic neuropathy, which in many ways is, is, is more common. Uh, and, and that would be especially a thambutol. That does not typically produce much in the way of optic disc swelling. So that's a retrobulbar process. The other thing that I, I want to go back to is, uh, is the patient who uh, has, you think might have giant cell arteritis when there is no optic disc swelling. Dr. Volpe mentioned to you that a very small percentage of patients with giant cell arteritis and optic nerve disease have, uh, have no swelling. A very small number have no swelling. The vast majority of them will have swelling. So already you're on a very small percentage of patients if you are, uh, if you are looking for a diagnosis of giant cell arteritis in a patient without a swollen disc. You can't ignore that possibility, but it, it's there. Shlomo, what would you say to that? Yeah, uh, I want to go back to your uh remarks regarding tapering of uh, steroids. Uh, ESR, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, has a great role in, uh, in my way of tapering down. So uh, I, I'm tapering down the steroids well, uh, whether the uh, ESR goes down or not, and the way it goes down. So whenever they... Uh, ESR is still high, I give it a little bit more time to go down. And uh, you told me that whenever the sedimentation rate doesn't go down, okay, you have to open the diagnosis. Yeah, this is a, a, another one of those difficult things. Uh, many people want to know what, what do you do with a patient who has a rebound? Uh, you get the, you get the, uh, the dose down and the, and the sed rate goes up again. That's a very difficult problem. This is why I asked the question to our audience about whether you take care of patients with giant cell arteritis or whether you just make the diagnosis. My guess is that most of you are not taking care of these patients. 
you're maybe looking at them, but you're letting somebody else, maybe an internist or a rheumatologist, make the decision about the uh, use of steroids. Steroid. Yeah, with the possible exception of when the patient complains of a new visual problem, that's when you have to get into the picture again and you have to help the rheumatologist uh, as to whether these new visual symptoms are pertinent to the diagnosis. Very difficult problem, very difficult. There's one other thing that, that I thought we should um, touch on, and that is somebody asked about um, OCT in distinguishing various acquired causes of optic disc elevation. In my opinion, uh, OCT is not at a place where it can make the distinction between papilledema and ischemic optic neuropathy and so on, all those diff other causes of acquired optic disc elevation. I think that the way you make that distinction is with clinical features, with the history and so on, and not with OCT. OCT is pretty good at distinguishing congenital, that is drusen, uh, uh, optic disc elevation from from uh, from acquired optic disc elevation, yes, because you can find drusen. But beyond that, I do not think it is very good. Not everybody agrees with me on this, but that's the position that I would take. Shlomo? On the same topic, uh, we're seeing more and more articles regarding artificial intelligence. Do you think that it will have some role in making this, this distinguishing or distinction between the acquired and the congenital cases of uh, optic disc swelling. Yes. I mean, I think one way to end this uh, session this afternoon is what you have heard, or this evening for most of you, um, is that you've heard some of the classic teachings in neuro-ophthalmology sprinkled with a little bit of the new information that's come in. I would say that, um, that the new information in the diagnosis of giant cell arteritis is still a little bit tenuous. We are looking for a more certitude about that as to whether it'll be useful or not. With regard to NMO and MOG, which uh, Dr. Pless talked to you about, that is, an, uh, is really very, is becoming clearer and clearer and is no longer uh, out there as hypothetical. I think that's a very serious new issue. Uh, thanks to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. They're the ones who helped us with that. And we really do have to take that seriously. Optic neuritis is no longer what we would call your grandmother's optic neuritis. It's more, much more complex now and requires much more nuanced approach to care and diagnosis. So I, I think, Shlomo, that's where I would um, would end my a commentary and um, turn it back over to you. Okay, I think that uh, our time is up. I would like to thank all the presenters for sharing their expertise with us and to all of you for your continued support of, for the SOE. Um, it's been a, a little bit longer uh, webinar than usual and I am sure that we all earned some of uh, some of the knowledge that you've taught us. John? Oh, okay, we're signing off. We're signing off. Thank you very much. And uh, have a very good evening, everybody in Europe. And here in the United States, it's still daytime. But uh, we were pleased to uh, combine with you. By the way, several of you wanted to know why there were so many people who were not from Europe. I don't think that's quite true. Dr. Dotan is from Israel, which is really in a way part of Europe. Uh, Gordon Plant is from the United Kingdom. I grew up in Europe. Misha Pless is from Bolivia and, and, and from Switzerland, uh, only lately in the United States. So I do think there was representation from around the world. This is the way it should be, by the way. Thank you very much and good night. Good night.